I am known for a podcast I do on my experiences as an exorcist. And that's The Exorcist Files. That is correct. What was the most difficult exorcism that you ever did? Have you sensed sort of themes or patterns in the sorts of sins that are involved? No, there's a pattern. I mean, What are the patterns? God has placed a limit on reality. So when you consciously choose to bypass that limit, in a dabbling in the occult, you are replicating the sin of Lucifer and his fallen angels. Even if the person doesn't fully realize that. Nobody ever chooses to be possessed by the devil, and yet it occurs. Father Carlos Martins, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Thank you for making time for this. I know you're very busy right now. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So first, for people who aren't familiar with you, uh, give us a little bit about your background. Sure. Yeah. So I am. Uh, I'm a Catholic priest. Uh, I'm in my 16th year of ordination. Uh, I have been um, the director of uh, a current tour with the the relic, the major relics of Saint Jude the Apostle, that are here in America. Uh, it is the first time that they have left Italy in 1700 years. So this is a special occasion in the church, and it's a busy time. It brings big crowds, and uh, it's in a different city every day. I am also, so I I am known for uh, conducting expositions of relics for the church, and uh, I'm also known for a podcast I do on my experiences as uh, an exorcist. And that's The Exorcist Files. That is correct. Which has been very popular, and I think maybe more than you imagined when you got into it. It's reached oh. many, many people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, I knew that it wouldn't be ignored, but I had no idea that it would have the popularity that, that it's turned out to have. So how many years have you been practicing as an exorcist? You know, it, it really began, it predated my priesthood. Uh, I was a deacon, and I was sent out to go do house infestations. Uh, so the, the church where I was first assigned... Uh, beginning as a deacon, and then I continued as a priest there. Uh, the priests there were the exorcists of the of the archdiocese, and they were so busy with possession cases and, and serious oppression cases that when something lesser would come in, like um, a house haunting, uh, a house infestation, uh, where where the demons had taken over a space for whatever reason. Um, I, w- I was sent in, and, and it happened kind of by accident. No one really planned it, but uh, the 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 pastor of the church there was handed a note by the secretary, um, you know, another house infestation. He just grabbed the note, gave it to me, and said, Demon, uh, Deacon, go get rid of the demon. So it was from that time, and I, so I, you know, I didn't have any training, uh, and so I, I, w- I would never recommend uh, that this be the format in which people are, in, in, in which a, a cleric is, is brought into the ministry. Nevertheless, uh, in my sake, uh, I would say that it, it turned out to be really fortuitous in the sense that everybody's model has its strengths and its limitations. I didn't have a model. As so an I, exorcist. As saying. an exorcist. I had to create my own. So I just went in, and, and what I remember was I had a principle in mind, and I, I honestly, I've tried to recall many times where I picked this up, and I don't know if I absorbed it from somewhere along the way. Uh, I don't think I, I did because I, I just, I don't have a memory of it. But the principle was if, the devil is, if evil is present somewhere, it's there for a reason. It's not random. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't strike like out of nowhere, like bad weather. It doesn't strike, you know, it's not, evil is not the same as, as bad luck. You know, that, that was the moment the, the part broke on your car kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a, there's a chain of events that were dependent upon that happening. And that usually entailed a covenant with evil, like some, some kind of sin covenant. So if the devil is there, in other words, he has the right to be there. And so it's a matter of uncovering what that right is. What was handed to him contractually? And so as long as that contract exists, so to speak, then he has every right to be there. So exorcism is not... 
it, it's not a matter of, of eviction. Like, but the job of the exorcist is not to cast out the devil, but to find out why is he there? What rights has he obtained? And then it's his job to work with the victim to rescind those rights. So it's not a combating, like, you know, you, you kind of each have a club and you're hitting one another and see, who, you know, who's going to outlast the other. That's not what exorcism is. You, you don't, you never pit your strength against the demons because they're demons. Uh, they, they, they have a lot of strength, but that strength is predicated upon the rights they have to be there. Go after the rights, not the demons. So in a house infestation, which is what you started doing as a deacon before you became a priest, what's an example of a right that the demon would have to allow someone to haunt the house? Is that haunting of it? Is, the, is that a soul that's haunting the house or is that a demon haunting the house? Give us an example of what this looks like. Sure. Um, well, I mean, souls and demons are two different things. So um, if it's a ghost, it's, it's something else. Um, so sticking with demons for the time being, what you have is is something either attached to the place or to the persons who occupy the place. And so they have entered into some kind of covenant through an action uh, and it, it, a sin. Uh, and any mortal sin is is a candidate, uh, but... You know, people commit mortal sins all the time and they don't pick up demons all the time. But you know what? Sometime you open the door and there was something behind that door and this is the time. What, just for folks listening who aren't familiar with the language, what is a mortal sin? Yeah, so, so in, um, in Catholic theology, uh, and this is, this is out of scripture, this is when, when the distinction is made by John the Apostle o- o- over sin that is deadly and sin that is not deadly. Uh, so our term for deadly sin would be mortal sin. So it is a serious sin, a serious violation of one of God's commandments. And it is done with full knowledge and deliberate consent, right? It's a, so we're dealing with a matter that is grave. It's done with the, the, the individual transgressor's knowledge that this was evil. And it's done with a, with a full consent, an adequate consent, such that there was a genuine choice that was made there. There was a decision made on the part of the transgressor to transgress God's laws. And so that, by definition, undoes the, the, the protections that your baptism gives you, right? It's at your baptism, you're made a child of God. God the Father is, is your father. Christ is your savior. The Holy Spirit is your sanctifier. You become a member of the family of saints. You receive the gifts, all of the gifts of the Spirit, they're implanted in you instantly. Uh, you receive your vocation, the, the configuration, the spiritual and otherwise, that God has planned for you. That now begins to take root in a, in a serious way. And you're given everything you need to live this life and to make that passage into eternity in God's kingdom when this life ends. All of that is undone with one mortal sin. God is not your father anymore. Really? Christ is not your savior. Not until there's reconciliation. Because you've rejected him with that You've rejected sin. him. That's right. And that's why it's called deadly. You have scripture. evicted God from within you. But just for people listening, because I know we've got some scrupulous folks who listen to the show <laughs> and different people have different struggles, but you, in order for it to be a deadly sin, as you're describing, you need to know that it's a deadly sin and Correct. fully consent to it. Know Correct. that this is wrong and I'm still going to do it. Correct. Freely. This is my right. choice. No one was holding a gun to your head. You you weren't uh, under a serious duress that would come from, say, extreme stress, extreme um, trauma in your life, wounding, uh, woundedness, um, that your abusive husband wasn't making you go get an abortion, for example, um, which... Uh, any 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 condition like that mm-hmm. lessens the gravity of the sin and 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 it would cease to be mortal. Um, the reality is that when it, when it comes to us making an assessment, it's not easy to tell at times, you know, if something is mortal or not. It, it's it's not it's not the easiest thing. It, it's it's certainly not self evident in every circumstance. Uh, so 
when that occurs, see, see, the, the, the question that I ask an audience when I'm teaching on exorcism, spiritual warfare, and so forth, is, is I, I ask them, when you were conceived inside your mother's womb, to whom did you belong? And invariably, you get, well, my mother and my father, and, you know, and that's incorrect. <laughs> the next answer is usually God, and that's also incorrect. So when you were conceived inside your mother's womb, you belonged to the enemy. So you were an act of creation by God who used your parents. Your parents contributed the, the biological matter that then became life in you. But God infused a soul in that moment. It took a special act of creation to bring you about. Although you had biological components uh, that followed the laws of nature, but the soul in you was implanted by God in, in a miraculous act, a supernatural act. But at the moment that you became a person, that you came to be, the moment you began to exist, the penalty for original sin applied to you. And so that original sin from Adam and Eve entailed a, or entails a belonging to the, king, to the kingdom of darkness, such that, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's worth recalling, until the moment Christ rose from the dead, no one went to heaven. Right? Did so everyone go to hell? Everyone did. Now, hell was eternal for the wicked, but not eternal for the holy, but they were waiting for the Messiah that would set them free. And that's also called limbo. Nope. <laughs> what is limbo, that called? limbo is um, um, it has no scriptural or basis. Um, <laughs> theological base. It, it was amusing. It was a, it was theorized by by Saint Augustine. It was a creation, um, but but it was it was hell in the sense that it was a place of eternal separation from God, right? A state of eternal separation. So Saint Joseph, foster father of Jesus, he was he was in hell. Right. Moses, the prophets, John the Baptist, right? No man born of woman was ever greater than John the Baptist. These, these are the words of the Lord. He was in hell. A hell with fire and brimstone? What kind of hell are we are I speaking don't, of? I've never been, so I couldn't tell you. But Have you asked a demon? Um, I wouldn't believe him anyway, because he wouldn't be obliged to answer that. We can compel a demon to answer truthfully about this mm -hmm. situation. How is he inside Mrs. Shep house here? How did he get there? What rights does he have over Mrs. Shep House? And he has to be honest about that. Well, we, um, not willingly, mm -hmm. but you grind him down. Mm -hmm. You grind him. You can compel that. Um, and and it, it, it can take a longer time. It can take a lesser time. But you compel that because of the authority you have as an exorcist. Mm -hmm. And you've been delegated. And, and so there are jurisdictions that supersede his. WeHeartNutrition.com is a wholesome product with wholesome values. This is a vitamin company which designs its product with the highest quality ingredients that are research backed specifically for wherever you are at in your life. So if you are a woman just seeking an everyday vitamin, WeHeartNutrition.com has got the best product for you. If you are seeking to conceive, you're hoping to get pregnant, they've got a product for you. If you are pregnant, they've got a product that's a great prenatal vitamin for you. If you've just had a baby and you need to replenish all of those depleted vitamins, vitamins in your body and minerals in your body, they've got the best product for you. We Heart Nutrition has got you covered wherever you are in your stage in life. And what's awesome about this company is it's not only an American-based company and a small family business, but they support your values. Did you know that a lot of the vitamins that are sold online or in the store are owned by conglomerates that actually oppose and hate family values? Not so with We Heart Nutrition. WeHeartNutrition.com actually donates a full 10% of its sales back to the pro-life movement, supporting moms and babies in need. So stop buying your vitamins from some big conglomerate that doesn't support your values, but instead go to weheartnutrition.com today, find the vitamin package that best fits the needs and where you are at in your life and order these amazing vitamins to help you thrive. That's weheartnutrition.com and you can use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your first order. That's weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. So I, I want to get to understanding exercise more and also lay people's role in that people who are evangelical they're not even catholics etc and just in deliverance in general but what you just said is so 
interesting. And I think a lot of people listening and myself are thinking it sounds so strong to say, oh, this innocent little soul, uh, yes, conceived in original sin, but, you know, created by God is, you use the word, I think, I don't want to get the phrasing incorrectly here, but they basically belong they, to the devil. they belong to the he devil. He has a jurisdiction over them. This is why we baptize, mm. because we're applying the victory of the Messiah to, to this child, to this and, new life. And if baptism isn't done? Then that's a problem. And there's death? Then this is a problem. And, and the what church... What about stillbirth? Well, so, so the church, all the church can do as, as being guided by the spirit of truth is it can repeat the truth that is given to it by God. And beyond that, it has to be silent. So we know and have a certainty that the sacraments give life because the seven sacraments are the seven ways Jesus Christ left to heal the world, right? So they convey divine life. And divine life is the highest form of life, obviously. It's a share in God's very being. When you baptize, you have a knowledge, a certainty. This child here that was just baptized is the newest member of, of the communion of saints. That this person, this child, this new life, that this, this newborn who has now been born again is, has a right to enter heaven. And that right remains and no one and, 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 and no one and nothing can take that right away, save a mortal sin. <laughs> so when he or she gets older and eventually misuses his or her freedom, then the effects of the baptism are undone. The, the baptism is not undone, but their effects are until there is reconciliation with God. So uh, to understand this correctly, if there is a soul or horrifically in the case of an abortion, the case of a miscarriage, of course, stillbirth, a, a baptism has not been completed, of course. What you're saying is the church can't affirmatively say where those souls go. Correct. We do not have that knowledge, but we Correct. can trust in the goodness and the grace, grace of God. We can hope. We hope. We, we look to God mm -hmm. who wants the salvation of all more than you and I do. Yes. Amen. And so he is the author of the hope mm -hmm. within us. So we, but we don't have the certainty. And, mm -hmm. and this is the, what we have to reconcile with. Mm -hmm. right? the, the sacraments, the, the jurisdiction that God has given the church is there to provide a certainty. And it's a wonderful thing. And when that certainty, when that certainty can't be had when it can't be applied, when something falls outside the domain and, and the jurisdiction of the church, the church prays. Mm. But as a, te as, a, as, a, as a teacher, it is silent at that point because we don't know. We don't know the eternal fate of a stillbirth, of, of the soul of a stillborn baby, of the soul of an aborted baby. We don't know the eternal fate. This is where limbo came through, right? Because... Um, look, it, we, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of revelation that every single soul descended to hell upon their deaths. That this, this is a fact of original sin. And this is why when Christ died, when he descended into hell, right? Cause so when he descended, he was receiving the punishment meted out to every human soul. But what, what scripture says is, but, but death could not contain him, right? Because he had lived the righteous life. So he, had, he was the son of God who had paid the penalty. And so he's coming down as, he's going down as one of the losers and he comes up as the victor, releasing the souls. And this is why on, on Good Friday, uh, they, they see the dead walking the streets, mm -hmm. right? So he has now released the righteous. And there was physical evidence of that. I think to the modern sensibility, especially today, uh, this idea that you can be an innocent child, innocent in terms of not using your reason to commit a sin, not willing to commit a sin. You can be a child, whether you're preborn or newborn or two years old, and you still have this penalty of original sin attached to you, especially if you haven't been baptized, right? You need the baptism to undo that penalty. I think to the modern sensibility, it seems unfair. Sure. What would sin, you say to that? Sin is unfair. Sin is unfair. I mean, it's unfair when a baby is born 
uh, to a crack mother in prison. Mm. That, that's unfair. But that injustice exists. Right? So we're, we're talking about, yes, an even greater injustice than that. But injustice exists. So right? the very like, fact that Adam and Eve sinned was unfair to all the people who would be affected it by their sin. the entire universe. It didn't rip just human souls. The entire universe was changed. Right? It became hostile. A hostile. It needed the direct intervention of God. It needed that. So Christ, and, and look, you know, if we lose sight of the extent of the penalty of original sin and the mistake that Adam made, and, and I'm specifically isolating him, so let's leave Eve aside really? for a second, okay? Why? The sin was Adam's. Really? Because the covenant was made with him, not with Eve. So there's, there's a debate about this. There's debates about all of this stuff, as you know, theological and otherwise, but about it being Eve who sinned first and then tricked Adam into sinning. And in that sense, Eve, you know, this is... She sinned, but it wasn't a deadly sin. The covenant was not made with her. When Adam sinned, when Adam ate the fruit, then all hell broke loose, right? That's, that's when the covenant was violated and now everything is different, right? Death, sickness has entered into the world. And why was the covenant not made with both Adam and Eve equally? Why just with Adam? That you would have to know the mind of God for that. Mm. But that's what happened. And this is why Christ had to be a new Adam to fulfill what was undone by the old Adam. And this is why Christ was prepared in Catholic theology by Mary, the new Eve, who birthed him. And so there is, there is a parallel here. Mm. So, so God did something with, a, with creation originally, with the, our first two parents, and they violated that perfect order that, that, that God instituted. And so God brought about a new Adam and a new Eve it, in order, to, in order to, to, to reconcile and to, and to renew what was spoiled and, and, and marred by sin. And that very first sin... I mean, surely it was a test of obedience. I mean, all of God's law, we, it, we are to obey, even if we don't fully understand something. But what exactly was the nature of Adam's first sin and Eve's? You had to have the potential for sin in order for love to be authentic and real. Because if there isn't the possibility to reject love, then there is no love, right? Then, it, then it's fake. And so now you, have, you, you, you need to introduce a dynamic where it is possible for me as your creature, God, to reject you in order for my love to be authentic. Like in, order, in order for my embracing to be authentic, there has to be the possibility of me turning away from you. And that's what they did. So they had a knowledge based on faith that God was supremely good, right? He was, he was their, their benefactor. And along came the serpent and he told a lie and he usurped them by making them desire more than what they already had. He so made, was it in, in a sense, was it some sort of greed that was the first sin? Sure. Greed for, to be uh, as powerful as God or as wise as God? Greed, you, you could, you could label it with different words. Mm -hmm. uh, so greed was a part of it to want more than your share and also a distrust of God. Wait, wait he's, he's been lying to you. He has? Oh. You know, so you have also the very fact that, you know, Eve dialogued with the serpent, right? And he said, you know, did he really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Well, no, it's a patent lie. I mean, that, that's incorrect. And she went and corrected him. No, we can eat from any tree except that one tree. Else we will die. Oh, you won't die. So that dialogue already, her entering into the dialogue was her undoing. So I she never... should have known not to talk to the snake? Right. And, and why? Why, well, why should she have known that? Even if, even if she didn't know, Adam should have known. He was given the charge to guard and cultivate the garden. Right? It was his job to keep watch. And he was silent. He allowed this to happen. And when she ate it... So was that, in a sense, the first sin, even before her sin of dialoguing with the serpent? 
that, that there was a, it was a sin, but it was not a deadly sin. It, it all of this set the stage for that. When Adam bit into that fruit, there's the sin that that we're all hell broke loose. So exorcism, let's go to that because so if yeah. we get the Adam and Eve stuff mm-hmm. wrong, nothing else is going to make sense. There, you will never see a need for a Messiah and a Savior if you don't understand what happened in Eden, right? If, 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 the, if the problem is misunderstood, the solution will make no sense. I think some people are awake up to reality about these things through experiences like with the demonic. It well, scares them. And that's where the proof hits the pudding, right? Yeah. That, that's where... Uh, biblical exegesis become it becomes real really fast. Although I would say some people, and I've heard this from, you know, people I've gotten to speak with directly, they may have an experience with the demonic, but it doesn't fully lead them to God. Unfortunately, they right. try to seek solutions outside of the truth of original sin, the truth of Christ's gift for us in His own life and redemption through Him alone. And then I'll, but I've seen that people can kind of sustain a different worldview around these things without perpetual a demonic assault. And is that because perhaps the demon is giving some space for them to be misled? I, I wouldn't have an answer for that because I, I would need to know the mind of the, the devil. The details, yeah. But, but also mm-hmm. God, he's also at play and he has a plan. Um, and so, yes, I mean, these are questions we always get. Like why, you know, two different people were involved in, in sin X, one of them gets infected demonically, but not the other. Why? I don't have an answer for mm. that. The very best way to start your day is with a steaming cup of coffee, but not just any coffee. You're going to want to drink seven weeks coffee because it is the most delicious coffee that you will ever taste. If you go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, you'll see all the different blends and roasts that they have, but this is low acid, gourmet, ethically sourced, small batch roasted, delicious coffee. It's what I love to drink in the morning and you're going to love it too. What I love about sevenweekscoffee.com is not only is it ethically sourced and the best beans, they use the top one to 2% of all beans in the world to make their coffee, but seven weeks coffee also gives a full 10% of all their revenue directly back to the pro-life movement, to pregnancy resource centers. In fact, they are almost hitting the milestone with your help of a half a million dollars, $500,000 donated directly to help moms and babies in need. You can be a part of this by going to sevenweekscoffee.com today. You can pick your favorite subscription of your favorite blend of coffee. My favorite is the medium Ethiopian roast. And if you become a member of the Heartbeat Club, meaning you're going to get coffee delivered to your door every single month, you'll get a full 15% off your order. And if you use the code Lila at checkout, you'll get another 10% off your order for a full 25% off your first order of seven weeks coffee. So go right now to sevenweekscoffee.com, pick your favorite coffee blend, put in your order, use the code Lila at checkout for up to 25% off your first order. Know that you're not only drinking a delicious cup of steaming hot coffee in the morning, but you are supporting the pro-life movement, giving back 10% of everything that you order to help moms and babies in need. Go check them out today. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. You are going to love this coffee and you're going to love this mission just as much. Two exorcisms for a moment here. What was the most difficult exorcism that you ever did? Gosh, you know that, um, it's impossible to answer because they're all different from a different perspective. Um, difficult in terms of the subject, like it could be a very young child. Uh, that's difficult simply because of the the innocence of the child. And how would a young child become possessed? Um, if the if the child is 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 before the age of reason, uh, so so incapable of committing a sin because there there isn't a sufficient maturity there um, through some covenant made by the parents, perhaps a consecration to a, a particular witch doctor or a deity. Mm-hmm. Um, through some generational sin that is there, some generational covenant that remains. Uh, so, so be, because... What's an example of that? Well, um, a pact made with the devil by um, a great-great-grandfather, for example. Um, for like worldly blessings in his family kind worldly of Worldly blessings, uh, treasure for 
um, a particular woman to, to agree to marry him, etc. Anything, any any earthly good, any created good. You make a you make a pact, you make a deal, and what are you willing to put on the table? I, what I want is um, I want a life down the road. I I want one of your future grandchildren, whom you will never meet. Let's say let say the devil offers that. Have you run into scenarios where this was actually the case? Absolutely, for sure. And it's not even that rare. What's an example? Um, well, there is there is one uh, for for um, safe passage out of a war torn area, right? For for the whole family. So th- this was not for you know I I would like to have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. This this was something uh, which which actually it took place um, centuries ago. So th- this this came up in the exorcism. Wow. So that there was this covenant made, there was a pact made, a deal made with um, a sorcerer, a soothsayer, uh, an, an agent of the devil who, who, who worked out deals on his behalf. And that, uh, that covenant was made in exchange for safe passage out of a war-torn area of Europe. Um, and the child was affected down the line sure. generations Se- later. Several were. Several were. So what is the remedy then? Um, Before so, I even ask that, I'm sorry, I have to ask, why do you think God permits that? <laughs> Generational sin exists because of the way that God has constructed the universe, which he's constructed a moral universe. So it is possible to do wrong. And we are all connected to one another. So when you do something wrong, it affects me and everybody else in the world, and vice versa, because we are all connected. So, what you so look, generational sin. I I have encountered discussions online and even articles written in in periodicals and so forth. Even some written by by theologians, even even some by priests, where they deny the existence of original sin. I'm sorry, of generational sin, mm. but. Generational sin is, is, there are many instances of it. For example, original sin, we baptize to get rid of it. That's a generational mm. sin, right? This child conceived in the womb had no part of Adam's sin. And yet the penalty of Adam is, is applied to this baby. When David, when he took a census against the law of God, God brought down a punishment, and he had to pick between three punishments. He had to pick. Which one do you want? All of the punishments were meted out on his people, not on him. But he was the one who sinned. And he said, why should my people suffer for my sin? And yet, that's what And what, what did God place. say? He had to pick. <laughs> it, it just, that, that, the, the leader... He who had spiritual jurisdiction. So in addition to political authority, he had a spiritual authority. And he sinned. And so this now comes down on the people. Well, and this is how the world works, right? Parents, it, like you said, the mother to the drug addicted, the child of the drug addicted mother, or the people who live in the nation with the corrupt leader who gets them into war, or other abuses that harms the people. Right. It's the way of the world. Right. David sinned with Bathsheba. Right? And, then, and then put her husband on the front lines to hide his sin and had him murdered. The baby died as a result of that. The scriptures are very clear, right? That the baby's life was taken. And there you have an example of a generational sin. But we can hope, and this is where we look to God's mercy because we know it's greater than our own and whatever compassion or empathy we have for the all of the victims That's of evil right. which are endless we are all victims of evil in one way or another as much as we also commit evil and for that child in the situation of Bathsheba and David God's mercy for that child is greater than even the sin and the death even of that you child bet. you bet and that's where the hope comes in right and so as an exorcist as as a priest uh, I'm I'm a person of hope first <laughs> because if I wasn't then I wouldn't survive what do you I, mean by that? I wouldn't be able to do this work. I wouldn't be able to deal with the ugly things that I do, right? And at the end of the day, you know, you can't help because you're human. You look at a situation, you're like, I, I just, I'm grieved for all of this from start to finish. 
and you walk away, uh, you drive away, you drive home, you drive in silence, uh, and you might be haunted for the rest of the evening. You might be haunted for the next day as well. And, but at a certain point, you just say, this, God has a plan. And, and, and what, what I have to acknowledge here in this moment, I am not God. I don't have to have a plan. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how to make this better like this. And if I could, I would do it Im- immediately. But he's God. Uh, he's chosen to not do it in the way that I would do it. And that's his prerogative. And so my job is to just serve him in the way that he wants me to serve him. And there's a freedom within that. Mm. Even though in the midst of ugliness, in the, in the midst of horror, you see things that are, that are sad, that are, that are grievous um, and egregious. Um, and you, you just, you have to turn it loose. Can you share an example of an exorcism that you performed that was particularly difficult for you, maybe on an emotional level, just dealing with the pain of the person that you're is suffering, and then how you dealt with that in the aftermath personally. Um, they're they're all difficult in that sense because they're all emotional, right? You're dealing with somebody in need, and you, as the exorcist, you're standing in the breach, so you're you're facing a being that is immortal, and that was there from the beginning. He, he, he is not equal with God, but he predates you immensely. Uh, and, and in his nature, he's far superior than you, in his nature, in his intellect, in his cunning, in his strength, and, and frankly, in just the hatred that he has. So that's a sobering thing, right? Like those kinds of rea- like I never look forward to them. Like they're not, they're not fun interactions. Uh, but at, at heart... There's a person here who's ensnared, and this bully is standing on that person, right? And so that brings up something in you, and right? It brings up a righteous anger. It brings up a sense of duty. Uh, it brings up a, a Christian courage because you're going in, to, in on a rescue mission to try to get this person out. And you're relying on the cooperation of the person, right? You, mm-hmm. you can hold down the enemy... Uh, for 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 a certain length of time, but it's up to this victim now. Okay, you, you've got to get up and you've got to walk now towards the one whom I serve because if you don't, you already know where you're going to end up. And as odd as it is, not everybody undertakes that walk. Uh, some some people, they, they, they want to get rid of the pain. They want to get rid of the prison that they're in when they're in a relationship with the devil. But they want to keep his gifts. Mm. What he's offered, they, they want to they want to hold on to that uh, because. What's an example of that? Well, um, a sexual prowess, um, a, a superior intellect, anything with which one can make a covenant with evil, um, terrible friends, um, a gift of wealth, for example, being lucky often, uh, any anything like that, um, psychic abilities. And the devil has the power to give those things. Sure. How does the devil give wealth? Because the devil has an access to reality and knowledge that we don't have. He can peer into situations uh, where he can bring things about. And uh, nudge people one way or another? Nudge to get people something. Um, something that's hidden somewhere and no one has any, I you know, a, a sum of cash in a safe somewhere buried underground and uh, everybody's lost sight of it. He, he can go and take it, for example. Um, he can um, give a doctor an ability to be astounding in the practice of medicine uh, and by guiding him, by guiding him even in the order of nature. Attack these cells with this concoction. Attack them in this way. Do it this often. How do people of goodwill navigate this? Because it, I mean, in one sense, it sounds very scary that maybe all throughout even our daily lives, we could run into people or situations that are actively being worked on by the devil. Uh, and, and, and they, and they are, <laughs> and they do. Uh, this, this is, this is really common. This is way more common than what, what, what I would like it to be. I mean, an exorcist is most, most of the ones that I know are very heavily worked. They may not all be full possession cases, but they don't have to be. 
the, the, the fact that there is an influence that's there where part of your being is under the dominion of the evil one. Well, now he can manipulate you. There, so there, there's parts of you that are, that are under his control. They're not owned by you. They're owned by him. Is this more common in today's time than it has been in history? Or do you think every, every decade, every era, the, de- the, de- the devil is just as active? You know, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, some people today say he's more active than ever. Um, I, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I am, I'm not one that um, thinks the present situation is necessarily more worse mm-hmm. uh, than, or worse, I should say. The present situation is not worse than uh, any of the previous ones. But I don't know that it isn't mm-hmm. uh, in addition. I, I've only lived in the generation yeah. that I've lived. Right. Um, is it getting worse now? Um, I, I would say that it is in the sense that we are becoming more dechristianized, mm-hmm. and there's there's a price to pay for that, because people are not they don't have the Christian compass, the spiritual compass to guide them in life, so they're making very pagan decisions, and that means they get ensnared in the traps that are out there, mm-hmm. and there, there are many traps that are set out there, and when they fall into a trap, they don't have the Christian understanding to know where north, south, and east mm-hmm. and west is. So so we we are quickly, quickly becoming pagan again. And, and, you know, in the early church, one of the great apologetics of Christianity over pagan cultures was the authority that Christian priests had, and Christians in general, not just the priests, but the authority that Christianity had over the demons which was something so different. Meaning the pagans a- appreciated that because they were being molested, harmed by demons. So right. they knew at least this priest can help me even if I don't want to follow his God. It gave credence to the God that he follows. Mm-hmm. Right? This is the God who is over all the other gods, over all the other demons, uh, over all these other forces that keep us terrorized. Right, so that there, there's a great apologetic there, mm-hmm. but we're entering into a place again, where paganism is leading people into entrapments by the devil. What are what do you mean by that? What are some of the hallmarks of paganism? What does it look like today? Yeah. So what does modern paganism look like? Well, it's um, it's not unlike old paganism. It's mm-hmm. it's non-Christian living. So a sense of, like, you become the measure of morality. You become the measure of your destiny. You, you pick what you desire to do with your existence and your relationship with others. You know, like Christianity, what did it do? Well, we saw the other, any other, and every other as having the infinite value of God because every soul was created in the image of God. So that means something, you know, that, that, that now curbs what I may want to do to you uh, or to get from you, uh, to take from you. It, it means now that, that I'm going to be accountable for my relationships with others, with myself, with my family, with even my country. Um, now it's, what do I want? Take um, as long as you don't get caught, you know, so the, the harm now becomes not the, the transcendent eye of God, but simply human law. You know, human, human, human security is your only threat now. And so people will do things like if you ask a random person, like if you, if you, could, if you were assured that you could never get caught on a human level, if you stole a million dollars from somebody, would you do it? Mm. I mean, walk down the street and ask that question. How many people would undertake that? I mean, probably more than one. <laughs> do you think that's maybe the prevailing kind of paganism today is uh, greed or taking material possessions that are not one's own? Or do you think many of that more has to do with the, the, the sexual? I mean, what would you say are kind of the most it's everything. common that you it's, see? It's it's the desire to become God. 
It's how we manipulate others. What can we do to an embryo to extract what we want from it? What can we do from, you know, hey, somebody who's less fortunate, well, we begin to view them as animals, right? So given, uh, we, we start making decisions in society over who lives and who dies. This person is too sick to save, kill them, right? Jump the morphine. So but a lot they of people, breathing. they would say they're doing that out of compassion, right? That's the, the prevailing, I think, argument from the pagans in our culture is that they are the compassionate ones. Yeah, and I think, I, I think it's a false compassion. I think it's a cop-out because you just don't want to stand with somebody who's suffering. We can remove their physical suffering. We can, we can, we can remove their pain, I, but, but it becomes easier. It becomes less expensive to keep them alive. You can shirk your own responsibilities by just increasing their morphine so that the, the breathing reflex stops. And so death has taken them, but actually you took them. You induced death. Right? They died because of you. Sure, they were going to die anyway because of the illness, but everybody's going to die. But we do have something called murder, mm. and there's an instance of it. So we are the, the movement to paganism is a movement to become God. There has ever only be, ever been one sin. I can play at being God, and so I will. This, this, is, this is what Adam and Eve did. This is how the devil tempted. You'll become like him. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper company. I love everylife.com because they not only make amazing products, these diapers are leak proof with great quality materials, but this is also a diaper that is made with love by a pro-life company that is giving back to the pro-life movement. So when you go to everylife.com, you set up your diaper subscription for that little one in your life that you love. You're not only getting an amazing product for your little one, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. Did you know that companies, unfortunately, like Pampers and Huggies, are owned by conglomerates that actually are pro-abortion that donate money to groups like Planned Parenthood? Not so with EveryLife. EveryLife.com is not only a best-in-class product for babies, but it also loves babies and supports babies by supporting the pro-life movement. So go to EveryLife.com today, order your diapers and wipes subscription, or gift a friend who might need diapers and wipes for their little one, and use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. That's EveryLife.com and use the code LILA at checkout out for 10% off your order. How many exorcisms have you done, Father? I don't, I don't keep a count. I mean, because there's cases and then there's multiple sessions mm. that it takes within the cases. But uh, over the years, uh, a great many, I've, I've had dozens of cases. Mm. Um, and some, some of them have taken many, many sessions. How often do they involve, have you sensed sort of themes or patterns in the sorts of sins that are involved? Or is it really any, like you said earlier, mortal sin, whether it has to do with sex, no, sexual No, there's issues, a pattern. I what, mean, are, what are the patterns? The most, the most common causes for possession are a participation in the occult and sexual sin. Those would be, would be the two. But, but the occult one is greater than, mm-hmm. than the sexual one. And it's greater because in... A dabbling in the occult, participating in the occult, you are replicating the sin of Lucifer and his fallen angels. God has placed a limit on reality, right? So, so when you consciously choose to bypass that limit, so you go consult a fortune teller, a Ouija board, to get information about things that you shouldn't know, you have no right to know, and, and God has placed a limit on it. But you go there, you are bypassing the limits. Like you are raging against God of, of, of you know, that, that's by definition, that's what you're doing. You are replicating the rebellion of the fallen angels. Even if the person doesn't fully realize that. Culturally, they think this is what I should do. Go to a psychic. It doesn't matter. They, n- nobody ever chooses to be possessed by the devil. Nobody ever does this. Nobody. And yet it occurs. So, so you know, the, the original case that brought about the movie The Exorcist, the, the original case upon which that movie was based, it was actually a young boy rather than, than a young girl who was possessed. It was an aunt that, that came over with a Ouija board and got this kid to, to play 
uh, at the Ouija board, and guess what? He became possessed out of it. Did he have any idea what he was doing? No. And I, I had an exact case like that. It was a seven-year-old. And I mean, by the time he came to me, uh, by the time his, his exorcism, he became one of my exorcism cases, he was into his 30s, but it was at seven years old. And, and it was his, his brother and their friends playing with a Ouija board, uh, and he participated. And now th- this kid, he, he, he didn't know anything. And he, he had been tormented his whole life? Oh, heavens, yeah. What did, I mean, what did his torment look like? So, um, so what occurs, so this is one of the cases on, on the podcast. Uh, on, it's one of the episodes. He, that night, after playing with the Ouija board, was visited by a figure in his room who offered him a deal. I will make you really strong in exchange for, and then he said a nonsensical word. So um, he requested something, um, and the individual now, his name is Jeremy, Jeremy couldn't recall today, like, you know, uh, two and a half decades later, what that was, what that word was. But he said yes. And so this figure jumped into the air and jumped inside him, and from that moment, he was extraordinarily strong. In sports? In everything. In everything. Like he like physically strong? Physically strong. Like he, he could beat up kids that were, uh, you know, when he was in elementary school, kids that were three years older than him and, and multiple ones. Uh, he ended up becoming a firefighter and, and broke every record at the academy, uh, every athletic record. So he had this incredible strength. What was the downside? The downside is... Well, clearly is the devil, but in you know, practical... Today, today is a Friday life. afternoon. It's 4.30 Pacific time. And all of a sudden, it's now the Monday after. He has no idea where he's been for the three days that have, that have gone past. He's on the other side of town. He has no shirt on, no shoes, and his knuckles are bloody. And he has an extra $3,500 in his pocket. And he has no idea where he got it. So all of that time is unaccounted for, and every action within it is unaccounted for. How many people do you think in our prisons right now were committing evil when they were possessed? I have no idea, but I'll tell you one thing. I used to do a lot of prison ministry uh, in my early priesthood, and I, and I remember going at one time into a death row, and I never, even in all the exorcism cases that I've had, I've never felt as much evil as I did inside that death row. And the sounds that were being made in that place, I mean, there was a collection of demons like I've never encountered in one place. Do you think that's because of the act of execution or because of the evil accompanying the executed? The evil present in, in those who, in the inmates that are in the prison. Who had committed some of the most heinous crimes. Yep. Consciously or unconsciously, Yes. When you're, uh, we're going a bit on a tangent here, but it's so interesting. If you are, you've committed a heinous crime, you plead insanity, and you can somehow prove insanity. You truly didn't remember when you committed this crime, and somehow it, but it wasn't insanity, me- medically speaking, it was the demonic. Mm-hmm. Have you come, run into this? Not legally, not not in a legal case uh, uh, in which I was consulted. I, I haven't, I haven't been consulted in any legal case, but. Can the devil make someone truly do something evil? Mm-hmm, for sure. Uh, I did know of a case like this uh, where an individual, um, and this was when in those years where I was doing a lot of pr- prison ministry, he, he talked to me about why he was in prison. He was in prison for multiple murders, and if I recall, it was three of them. And he did them in an afternoon in a home, and he had been a Satanist, so he had decided, okay, I'm going to start worshiping the devil. And he was doing his version of a black mass. And then all of a sudden he wakes up in somebody's home. There's three dead bodies around him. And he said to me, it had to be me because there was no one else around. And then all of a sudden coming, uh, turning into the driveway of the house, he could see from the front window was a, was a police cruiser. And This happened in the middle of the afternoon, and he said, I've read all of the reports. I've read all of them. They all say the same time. It was in the middle of the day, and it had to be in the middle of the day because not everybody could be wrong, and there couldn't be this conspiracy of 
of them making up a, a false time, a, a, a false time of the day where this occurred. But when I saw that car turn into the driveway, it had its daytime running lights on, like the, the mild form of the headlights. But the day was pitch black. So what it looked like was two, it looked like it was in the middle of the night and this cop car pulls into the driveway. In other words, this man is seeing reality from the eyes of the demons because for them, everything is dark. So although it was in the middle of the day, he didn't have access to what we have access to and seeing, seeing the daylight the way we see it. He saw night. You and were so, speaking with this man. Oh, yeah, personally. Did he ever find deliverance? Did he ever find he certainly, God's grace? He certainly was repentant. Like, he, he, well, I don't know where he is now. Uh, like, he was there for life, multi, three life sentences, so he will never see the light of day. Repentant for the murderers and also for being a Satanist or just for the murders? Yeah, because he was coming and meeting me. Okay. Right? <laughs> I mean, he was seeking out Thank God. to further his relationship with God. So he was repentant of the Satanism that opened the door to these mm. horrible and evils. And 20, 20 years of prison had done its thing, too, right? Wow. It, it grinds you pretty good. Well, then what about someone, though, who is possessed not by the fault of their own? This man chose to be a Satanist, and then all of a sudden he's murdering people. What about the case of a child who is uh, oppressed or possessed because of someone else's action or an innocent person who's just right. attacked by Satan because of someone else's evil? Right. And then we say, okay, it's not fair, but okay, let me tell you about a different case that I met in prison. Uh, so I met this man, he was um, 38 years old, and I, this was in my first year of the priesthood, I, maybe I was a deacon at the time, this was either 2008 or 2009, at that time he was 38 years old, and he's in there for life, for multiple rapes, and murders. He was the son of a prostitute. And what he remembers growing up is constantly being hungry, constantly, and never being fed. And he had a little brother, and his little brother was hungry. And so he remembers John's walking by. He would be on the landing of the apartment building, outside the apartment, and they would, they would walk by to go visit his mother, and a lot of them would, would kick them, beat them. And so one day, in a fit of hunger, he goes and he tries the doors of the apartments, and he manages to get in one. It was unlocked, and there was food inside. And so he took food for himself and his brother. And so from that moment, he, he, he realized, no one is ever going to give me anything. If I want anything, I have to take it. So, so there is a paganism. There's an example of that. But he was taught it by the sin of his mother and the sin of these and men. And the circumstances of life. Heartbreaking. Right? Uh, and the, the circumstances of living in a broken world. And so then when he became sexually mature, well, if I want something, I just have to take it. And there you have it. And so the safest place for him in the world, for his own sake and for others, is to be in prison. So he was 18. Uh, pardon me. He was 16. He was 16 when he was arrested uh, and charged, and he was charged as, as an adult. Uh, so he was now 38. So he's been in prison 22 years. Most of his life is, uh, he's only 38 years old. Most of his life has already been spent in prison. And yet that's the place where he needs to be. But in that story, there wasn't a possession. Nope. There was just but it's the not wound fair. of sin. It's not fair. But I this see. is the point. This is an analogy, mm. right? So, so. Yes, it's not fair in the spiritual realm where we inherit these dysfunctional conditions from our family, from our ancestry. Well, neither it is, neither is it in, in, the, in, the, in the physical realm, but yet it happens. All right? so, so what you can say about one, you can say about the other. Like there's the, the same examples of the, the, there's examples of the same kind of dysfunction happening in each realm. What did you observe God's mercy look to look like for him as he was in that prison at you know what i i really enjoyed speaking with him mm -hmm. there was a maturity that was there prison had done its thing right he had matured there he had made some he became an adult in there he wasn't an adult when he went inside uh, he had been reached out to by clergy and he had embraced an identity at some level 
with Christ. Like, he was open to it. Mm-hmm. And he could see that this is different than anything else. And, and in many prisons, um, a religious program is the only kind of program that you have, mm-hmm. right? especially in the South. You have churches that are funding uh, the ministry happening, doing retreats within prisons. Um, I, I used to lead a bunch of them. Um, taking your time out and, and going and, and giving, you know, they'll allow you to bring in a bag of candy, potentially, if, especially mm-hmm. if you form a relationship with the warden. Of course, they search everything, but, but you have candy. This is the only mm-hmm. nice thing, the only treat that they're going to get. And, you know, when I would go, I would eat with them. So I would eat the prison food in the cafeteria with them. And there was nothing that I thought was, nothing was disgusting. Nothing was horrible. But it was very simple and you didn't get tons of it. Mm. Right? So you, you had to make do with that. So along, you know, somebody comes in and they've got a candy bar. Mm. Well, this is the only this is the only sugar high or chocolate high mm-hmm. that you're going to get maybe this month. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're, you're willing to do something for that. Maybe even sit down and listen to a sermon for that, mm-hmm. listen to a, a teaching. But in the midst of that, God, God manages to get through. Someone might hear a story like the one you just shared. And I know I think about Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and one of her motivations that she wrote about was she saw what she considered such a, uh, extreme poverty and suffering that she thought we, it's better to not exist. It's better that you don't have children at all. And then later on abort the child, if there is a child and again, done in the name of compassion mm-hmm. to stop any of these tragic choices in life to be made, the suffering that is subsequent to stop it all from happening, just end the life before it's even begun. What would you say to that? That is the desire to be God. That, that is a replicating the sin of, of, of the fallen angels. And, and there are consequences for that. All right, so we have to have the humility to be humans and to accept the fact that we are not God. And we work towards making the world a better place by incarnating Christ and, and the love that he brought. That is new. That has brought about more good than anything on a human level. I mean, it is, it is brought about, it has convinced the most hardened hearts when they saw an act of love, a selfless act of love. And people have changed, cultures have changed, right? Look at, look at Mexico, look at the Aztecs. You know, within, after, shortly after the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico, the, the, the mass killing stopped. Eight years later, it didn't exist any longer. What mass killing? So in, when the Aztecs uh, would dedicate a temple or, or and, and, and regularly, periodically, they would have the slaughter of, of people, of humans, in order to, to placate, to please the gods, to avert their anger. Especially children, right? Especially children. But you have, you, you have in, in, so there was one four-day period, there were so many thousands that it worked out to four per minute were being killed, were being beheaded. And, their, and their, their heads were being rolled down the side of the temple. I mean, this is, the, this is the way of life. And all of a sudden, one apparition comes. And that act of love is so convincing that eight years later, there's no sacrifice anymore. It's done. It's is, now, it, is abortion kind of our human sacrifice today? How would you That's what it is it? today. Now, I, b- I believe it will end. It's going to mm-hmm. end. Uh, we, we've seen great strides even in, in our lifetime. And we, we see this, um, there's, there, there's a, uh, certain young people that have become critical enough to begin questioning the, the, the pass that the culture gives abortion to, to the, the notion of abortion, of eliminating a problem through the killing they, th- there's a movement within young people that is a serious movement of pro-life, towards pro-life, and it's come out of nowhere. It's come out of nowhere in the sense that nobody has taught them this. They didn't get it from their parents, nor from their friends. They sure as heck didn't get it from the culture. And yet within them, there's this conviction that all life is sacred. Mm-hmm. And that human life, that, that the smallest person 
the most insignificant person is worth protecting. And, and I mean, how do we chalk this up? Hmm. Right? This, this, is, this is God. Hmm. God is raising up something. And this is at the end of the day, no matter how much evil you see, God is an active player in the world. He's very active. He, he is God. And he, and he never relinquishes <laughs> his, his Godhead. Uh, and he's operative. And, and I see it. And I think we, we all can see it if we choose to look, if we just observe what is happening. There's a lot of ugliness, but there's a tremendous amount of good that is coming forward. Father Martins, I want to respect your time. I know we got an hour from you and we've already a little bit past it just to conclude our time together. Any final words for folks listening about how they can live more closely in line with God's will and be powerful with God against the attacks of the devil? Sure. Yeah. Take, take seriously the life of the sacraments. Live the sacraments. Attend church on Sunday. Confess your sins. Be free of sin. Uh, if, if your friends are a problem, get rid of them. Get yourself good people in your life. Get rid of the stuff that brings you down. Live a good life. Pursue God and the devil will flee. And, you know, I think the questions you've asked, are, they're good ones, um, especially with regard to the exorcism stuff. I do have a podcast, The <laughs> Exorcist Files, that goes through cases, uh, actual cases that I had and where I, um, the, 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 the cases are reenacted and for the purposes of spelling out what exactly occurred in them. So how was evil defeated here? What was God doing? What was Christ doing? Uh, what did the devil want? And how did God prevent him from bringing that about? So that's why I produced it, um, is to give people a, a knowledge of God and, frankly, to use the devil as the fifth evangelist because there's a way in which the devil is um, unwittingly and certainly to his own um, detriment but chagrin as well. He is, in one sense, you could say, the greatest proclaimer of Jesus Christ and his victory. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much, Father Martins, for joining the podcast. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. I thought it was fascinating getting to talk to Father Martins, and there are so many takeaways. I hope you enjoyed the conversation too. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends, and please don't forget to rate this episode on your podcast app wherever you're listening and leave us a review that helps the show reach more people. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.